enjoy the special music. Christ has come to set the shepherds and the wise men and all men free. Um, and the angel declared that when they came to announce Christ the Savior is born. What a wonderful 2020 we had, didn't we? Our, yeah, that's true. There has been great times of hardship. There have been um, struggles, trials. I know last year at this time we had these little uh, whispers or maybe some noise about some virus over in China. And I know it's interesting, but people would say, what can I do for Christ? What can just one person do? Well, let me tell you, there was one person that contracted the China virus or the COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it. And it has affected the whole world, hasn't it? You know what? One person doing sold out for God can have a tremendous impact upon the whole world. The ripples can go all over the place. And it's amazing how we are all connected. Whether we like it or not, we are connected with people over in China. And the proof is in the COVID-19, isn't it? <laughs> For I know many people was a time of great hardship, a time of great trials. We've seen it here within our church even. But there's also been really good things that came of it too. There have been times of blessings, times of peace, times of joy, times of happiness. And the reality is, if you're a believer, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? There is warfare. And there will be. It's never going to stop. And you know what? I don't know what 2021 holds. I don't know when you're going to be able to go back out to a restaurant again. I don't know when you're going to get to take a face mask off in Myers. I don't know any of those things. But I know someone that does know all of those things. That's God, isn't it? You know what? We talked in Sunday school a little bit this morning about persecution and hardship and what it does for the believer. It refines him. It draws him closer to God. It also separates, if you will, the wheat from the tares. We start to see who the true believer is when the hardships come. And if anything... If everything we've gone through has sapped your joy, has sapped your happiness, is filling you with anxiety, filling you with fear, then I can guarantee you something. Satan is winning in your life. You know what the Bible says about God, about the Holy Spirit? He is not a God of fear. He is not a God of anxiety. He is a God that can be trusted. He is a God of peace. Matter of fact, that's why Christ came, right? The Prince of Peace. You know why he's the Prince of Peace? Why Christ was the Prince of Peace? Without him, we will eternally be at war with God. Because you'll rely upon your flesh and flesh alone. When Christ came and he died on the cross, he ushered in peace for the believer because we can be in a right relationship with God. We can go to heaven. So even though we've had trials and hardships in 2020, guess what? 2021 for the believer will be filled with trials and hardships. And the older I live, and I'm sure you know this to be true yourselves, 
the more we recognize that it's hard for the world to have any kind of peace. Because the world's peace is simply the lack of troubles, the lack of trials. But for the believer, we can have peace because it's attached to the Prince of Peace. Ephesians in chapter 6 is where we find ourselves today. And my message is, of course, more associated with the start of a new year. New beginnings. And we do like New Year's, don't, you? don't we? We have this great idea of, of all of the, the things, the great things that can happen for the year 2021. And many times we make New Year's resolutions and we make this uh, promise and we do this and we do that. It's a time of refreshing. So as we go through Ephesians in chapter 6, there's been some things that was learned. We preached through Ephesians, I think probably finished up about a year ago. <laughs> and we've been in Philippians and then Colossians, so maybe it's been a year and a half ago or so. Time goes by so fast. When we were in Ephesians, we found that there were some great realities of being in Christ. And it's the thing that the world is looking for. These realities are. One, if you're a believer, you belong to God. You have the Holy Spirit. You're adopted. You stand in Christ, which puts you positionally in a right relationship with God for eternity. Which means when it comes time for the judgment, the gavel has already been swung for the believer. You are righteous through the blood of Christ. That was my gavel, in case you were wondering what I was doing there. <laughs> Bang. Then we saw, and then in chapters 4 through 6, start talking about your practice. Since you're already in a right relationship, your practice should match who you are spiritually. So it tells us how we should live tells us that you have tremendous power. It's there. You just need to plug yourself into that power source. It gave us a road map of how to live the righteous lifestyle. It told us that the spirit ignites us. It brings everything into being. You can do the things that God has asked you to do and you can walk worthy. But then when we get to chapter 6 where we find ourselves there is Satan. You know what? He hates God. For the believer if he's out there he's living the spirit filled life he's dying to the flesh daily He's on this spiritual map that God has given to him, and he's on his way, one way, direct, with Christ in his view. He's not getting sidetracked by all kinds of things. Guess what? Satan is there to give you all those exits off the highway. <laughs> to entice you with the world's largest ball of yarn. That's what you usually see when you drive down, what, Route 66 or something like that, right? World's largest thermometer, world's largest whatever. And you, oh, I want to go see that. <laughs> He's trying to get you to lose your direction. Trying to get you to go do and commit sin. It's a warfare. We don't need to fear. We don't need to be filled with mistrust. We don't need to submit to Satan. So when it comes to the Christian life, and we call it a warfare, then what we see in Ephesians is we need to do something about it. And he tells us here in verses 10 through 13 how to do it. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. It's a fight. To Timothy, he told him to be a good soldier who endures hardships. They're coming. 
Jesus' ministry was with war with Satan the whole time. Constant conflict. And if you think the Christian life is easy, then I'd be inclined to say you're probably not living the believer's life. Because it'll be hard. Satan will always make the lives of thriving Christians difficult. Many men, by the way, in the ministry, the moment the hardships come, they just jump ship, don't they? Just get off. Way easier not to live this lifestyle. Just allow Satan to win. And I admire you guys today. You're here. You're fighting the fight, aren't you? You're fighting the battle. You know what? Coming to church in today's day and age is a little difficult, isn't it? With all the pressures of the world around us, and everything that's been going around and being said, it could be tough to get up, go to church. I read this uh, quote. I forget which pastor said it. But he said, All my life, I'll fight the devil, and when I've lost my teeth, I'll gum him until I die. <laughs> That's giving your all, isn't it? You see, we're sons, we're servants, we're soldiers. Our battle is not with flesh, it's spiritual. And Satan is at work in the believer's life. So what do we do? I'm going to tell you, first of all, prepare. Be prepared. You know what? If you are not prepared, you will lose. No doubt about it. And that happens in all areas of life, doesn't it? Whether you're talking about business, whether you're talking about sports, whether you're talking about any anything in your interpersonal life, if you're not prepared for things to happen, you're just going to simply lose. I've seen sports teams that had the most amazing players on their team. But with a bad coach or with lack of preparation, they still end up losing, don't they? I've seen it over and over and over again in basketball, high school basketball. I've seen tremendous basketball players and tremendous teams that just simply lose because the team ends up being all about me, 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 and they don't play as a team, and some other team comes along that has inferior athletes and players, and they win because they're prepared for the other team. It happens all the time. Now, I want you to know when it comes to spiritual things, it's the same way. If you sit back and say, well, I'll deal with it when it comes, you will be unprepared. And you will lose. That's why he says in verse number 10, finally. So this is the last of the major themes in this book. He's given you everything you need for, for life, for Christian life, for the believer's life. Finally, my brethren. He wants to identify with this group of people that is struggling. You know what? He identifies with you today. Because I know you're struggling. Somewhere you're struggling. Everything's not easy. There's hardships. So he says, my brethren, he's identifying with this group of believers that are strong, that they're struggling. And then he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's where it all starts. Be strong. And by the way, the word in is there twice, right? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's where you're going to get it. Don't be strong in yourself. Don't be resolute in yourself. You don't pick yourself up by the bootstraps. That's an old saying, right? Pick yourself up by the bootstraps. You don't have to. You do it in the Lord, in God. He supplies it all. Which means 
you've already won the battle. If you're in the Lord, if you're in God. Some people say, well, Pastor Matt, why do I fail every time? Some people just simply aren't in the Lord. They don't know the Lord as their personal Savior. They go to church, but they're not a believer. Big difference, right? They've never given themselves to Christ. They've never recognized that they're a sinner and they can't do anything for heaven. Their, their faith rests in what day of the week they go to church. That they go to church. <laughs> that they read their Bible. They've got a bunch of head knowledge. But they've never <coughs> confessed Christ as their personal Savior. And you know what? They will fail every time. They will lose the battle. We are in him, in Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who <coughs> strengthens me. That's where it comes from. And you can. You can do all things in, through Christ. Spiritual things. It can happen. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move the mountains in your life. There's things that just look like a giant monster. And you think, I just can't win. And that's Satan. With a little bit of faith, you can move that monster, can't you? And by the way, if Christ defeated Satan at the cross, and you are in Christ, you've already defeated Satan. So have your strength in the Lord. There's no reason to lose. There's no reason to be afraid. We have resources in Christ. We don't need to be anxious about anything. God's in control. He's sovereign. Then, the second thing you have to do in verse number 11, put on the whole armor of God. You have your strength in God because you're already a believer. Your part now is to put on the armor. When you put the armor on, you are fulfilling your portion of being prepared. See, when you don't put on the armor of God, even though you, you, you know positionally you're already in Christ, you're already in God, you already have all the power, but if you don't do your part, you're going to be standing before Satan and he's going to shoot his fiery darts and what are you going to use to block it? <laughs> Your hand? <laughs> That's going to hurt. By the way, the fiery darts that are described in the Bible that, that they're describing when they talk about Satan shooting his fiery darts at you, it, it's an arrow or kind of even a short arrow that is hollowed out and they would fill it with pitch. Set that thing on fire and shoot it. And then we know what the, the armor of God is, right? We have the shield of faith. When they talk about the shield there, it's a great big shield. It stand four foot tall. And they would wrap it with leather. And they would uh, soak it in water. And guess what happens when that fiery dart comes and it hits that shield and it explodes? It hits the wet leather and guess what? It goes out. Yeah. But you must be prepared. What happens if you don't have the shield of faith? The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. Preparation of the gospel of peace. The belt of truth. Your feet shod with the preparation of God, God, the preparation of the gospel of peace. What happens if you don't have those things? That fiery dart hits and it explodes, and you're on fire, aren't you? You lose. So put on the armor. Be prepared. That is the condition, the condition that allows God. To work in your life. To exert the power. 2 Corinthians 
12, 9 says, When I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, quit relying upon yourself and rely all on God. 2021, we have great hope in it, don't we? And we can have great victories if we're prepared. We will have great defeats if we're not prepared. When he says, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, in the Greek, it means once and for all. Put it on, never take it off. Leave it on. Don't set it down. And I know, you're going to get tired. Have you ever held anything for a long time? <laughs> you know what I used to do as a teenager? I used to detassel corn. Baileys, if you're listening to this, I used to detassel their corn. And you know what you have to do when you detassel corn? You got to pull the top off of corn. We don't, kids don't do that around here much, do they? Down in Kalamazoo, we detassel corn. They plant, I think, two rows of male corn and then four rows of female corn. And the female corn, that little thing that grows off the top, that little, you got to grab it and pull it off. The male corn then pollinates the female corn. The nicest way to have it happen, by the way, is you get in these, they, they got these great big, huge, tall tractors that go over the top of the corn, and then they've got these arms that go out, and the baskets line up in between each row of corn. And you get in each basket, two of you do. One guy facing this way and one guy facing this way. And your job, as the tractor goes down, is to pop the top off of every single corn. Let me tell you what, first row, no big deal, right? Second row, gets a little harder. By the end of the day, you know how your arms feel? And if you just quit doing it, because <laughs> your arms are tired, you get in big trouble. They don't want to keep hiring you. And then walking up cornfield was the worst. Because all of the blades of the, the leaves, they cut. And when I was 13, I weighed like 70 pounds. And that's the truth. <laughs> I would put a bandana across my mask because the leaves would cut my face. And you'd still have to go and reach up and try to pop the tops of those things off. No fun! It's hard work. But guess what? You take one second off, you know what Satan's going to do? He's going to shoot a dart right at you. I guarantee you. Put that armor on and never take it off. You know, another thing that has happened, Satan works in tremendous ways in the churches. In our churches across America, it's so true. People have become gullible. They don't think they need to put on the armor of God. They don't even realize that Satan not only has a toehold in their life, but just had complete control of their life. Satan's getting them to do anything and everything that he wants them to do. They're his puppet. We think if we have facts in our head, we're fine. But if you want to win, get that armor on, get your life right, and when you do, it'll be a battle until you die. Let me tell you about the enemy. Because verse number 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. And what do you do? that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Whenever I hear that word wiles, I always think a wily coyote. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't so wily, was he? He always lost. The devil is wily. You know what it means? It means he will use any tactic to get you to lose. 
You know who the father of lies is? Satan. First Peter describes him as a roaring lion seeking to devour anything and everybody. The Bible also describes him as an angel of light. That's why he's wily. That's why he's the father of lies. He presents himself as the truth. And if he can get people to believe he's the truth, he wins. Why are there some pastors that just seem to have it all and just it seems like everything is easy and you know they have no issues and no problems? That might be because they're just simply being used of Satan in a tremendous way. Satan has no reason to attack a pastor that is preaching false things from the pulpit. Pastors that denounce that Christ is God, why would Satan attack him? He's doing Satan's work. Pastors that would say Christ was not born. Christ was not Emmanuel. John 8, 44 tells us that Satan is a murderer and a liar. 2 Corinthians 11 says he's an, an intimidator. Ephesians 4.14 says he's intelligent, old, and crafty. And you know what it's like, don't you? When you get and experience things, you become pretty crafty in some of your ways, don't you? You look down on the, you look at the young kids of today and you think, what in the world? <laughs> They've got so much to learn. What's wrong with them? You get wise. Let me tell you what, Satan and his demons have been around for a long time long time they're crafty they know how to work their ways into Christians and he's so good that he got Israel to worship idols and turn their back on God in the future he's going to deceive them again and get them to thinking that the Antichrist is Christ he got Adam and Eve to doubt and to sin. And so verse number 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wrestle there, for we wrestle not. In the Greek, it literally means two hands being wrapped around your neck. That is Satan for everybody in this world. His hands are wrapped around your neck, and he wants to squeeze the life out of you. When I was in college, I was really small. I'm way bigger than I was in college, especially my freshman year. I grew three or four inches, gained about 20 pounds, and made it all the way up to like 140. My college roommates loved to wrestle me. They were bigger than me. They were stronger than me. And I was like a rag doll to them. And I was bendy. You could take my arm and wrench it all the way up my back, and I could scratch the back of my head that way. They loved to do that to me. My one college roommate hung me from the end of the bed by my underwear. Lots of fun. <laughs> one day when, I, when we were wrestling, and the, and the goal was to get me to say uncle, and there's just no way I was going to say uncle. I don't care what you did to me. You could dislocate my shoulder. I wasn't going to say uncle. I'm a pretty stubborn guy. <laughs> One day when my, when my roommate was wrestling me, he got me in a leg lock around my neck, and he squeezed on my neck till I couldn't breathe, literally could not breathe. And I remember slapping his leg because I couldn't, I couldn't yell out, hey, you know, I can't breathe. 
And I slapped his leg like this until I passed out because I couldn't breathe. Then he let me breathe. I'm going to tell you what, that's a horrible feeling, isn't it? Having the life choked out of you. And I, did, I, just, I remember slapping his leg. And then he looked at me and he said, Uncle. And I said, no way. <laughs> and he let me out. And I said, I win. <laughs> but that's a horrible feeling. And that's what Satan wants to do to you spiritually. He wants to wrap around your neck, choke the spiritual life out of you, and make you just like the world. If you don't put on that armor of God, you lose. Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You know what? Here's the thing. Oh, I, found, I sound like Joe Biden. Here's the thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here's what he's saying to us. Sometimes, when you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you have those shoes on with the hobnails, you know what? You can move forward, can't you? And if you're a believer and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be able to move forward at times. Satan is going to attack on any advancement you make. And when he does, sometimes just standing is all God wants of you. Withstand. Stand. Don't retreat. Don't go back. Don't fall down. Stand. You know what happens after his attack comes? That fiery dart comes. It's quenched. It's, it's put out. Guess what happens? You get to move forward again, don't you? But if you take a step forward and you do it in 2021 and that fiery dart comes and it's going to come in all kinds of different things. It's going to be anxiety. It'll be fear. It'll be doubt. It'll be one hardship after the other. If it comes and you don't have the armor on, you've got pieces missing, Satan's a good shot. It's going to sneak through the armor. It's going to hit. It's going to hurt. And you're going to fall down. You're going to fail. And we don't want to be that person, do we? And let me tell you what. Once you go down, it's hard to get back up. So put on the whole armor of God. Be prepared for the battle. And having done all, stand. You can do it during this year. You can do it. God will be there the whole way with you. Your only part that you have to do is to put on the armor of God. He supplies the power. And you'll make it through. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you just for this lesson you've given to us today. As we think about the year 2021, there is going to be tremendous things that are going to happen. There's going to be hardships along the way. And as we overcome, we'll see the tremendous work that you're doing. We'll see how we're going to draw closer to you. As persecution comes, we draw closer to you. And Lord, I pray that we can see how we have and Lord, I pray that as we stand and move forward, we can see just the tremendous things and, and the great glory that you receive through it all. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Number 197. Number 197.